Chapter Twenty Five. Is it them? Singing the Doxologer. Awful square funeral orgies. A bad investment. The news was all over town in two minutes, and you could see the people tearing down on the run from every which way, some of them putting on their coats as they come. Pretty soon we was in the middle of a crowd, and the noise of the tramping was like a soldier's march. The windows and door yards was full, and every minute somebody would say over a fence, Is it them? And somebody trotting along with a gang would answer back and say, You bet it is. When we got to the house, the street in front of it was packed. And the three girls was standing in the door. Mary Jane was red-headed, but that don't make no difference. She was most awful beautiful, and her face and her eyes was all lit up like glory. She was so glad her uncles was come. The king he spread his arms, and Mary Jane she jumped for them, and the hare lip jumped for the duke, and there they had it. Everybody most, leastways women, cried for joy to see them meet again at last and have such good times. Then the king he hunched the duke private, I see him do it, and then he looked round and see the coffin over in the corner on two chairs. So then him and the duke, with a hand across each other's shoulder and t'other hand to their eyes, walked slow and solemn over there, everybody dropping back to give them room, and all the talk and noise stopping, people saying shh, and all the men taking their hats off and drooping their heads, so you could have heard a pin fall. And when they got there, they bent over and looked in the coffin and took one sight, and then they bust out a crying so you could have heard them to Orleans most. And then they put their arms round each other's necks and hung their chins over each other's shoulders. And then for three minutes, or maybe four, I never see two men leak the way they done. And, mind you, everybody was doing the same. And the place was that damp, I had never seen anything like it. Then one of them got on one side of the coffin, and t'other on t'other side, and they kneeled down and rested their foreheads on the coffin, and led on to pray all to themselves. Well, when it come to that it worked the crowd like you never see anything like it, and everybody broke down and went to sobbing right out loud. The poor girls, too, and every woman, nearly, went up to the girls without saying a word and kissed them solemn on the forehead, and then put their hand on their head and looked up toward the sky, with the tears running down, and then busted out and went off sobbing and swabbing and, and give the next woman a show. I never see anything so disgusting. Well, by and by the king he gets up and comes forward a little and works himself up and slobbers out a speech, all full of tears and flapdoodle about its being a sore trial for him and his poor brother to lose the diseased and to miss seeing diseased alive after the long journey of four thousand mile but it's a trial that's sweetened and sanctified to us by this dear sympathy and these holy tears and so he thanks them out of his heart and out of his brother's heart because out of their mouths they can't words being too weak and cold and all that kind of rot and slush till it was just sickening and then he blubbers out a pious goody-goody hey man and turns himself loose and goes to crying fit to burst and the minute the words were out of his mouth somebody over in the crowd struck up the doxologer and everybody joined in with all their might and it just warmed you up and made you feel as good as church letting out music is a good thing and after all that soul butter and hogwash i never see it freshen up things so and sound so honest and bully then the king begins to work his jaw again, and says how him and his nieces would be glad if a few of the main principal friends of the family would take supper here with them this evening, and help set up with the ashes of the diseased, and says if his poor brother laying yonder could speak, he knows who he would name, for they was names that was very dear to him and mentioned often in his letters, and so he will name the same to wit as follows, viz., Reverend Mr. Hobson, and Deacon Lot Hovey, and Mr. Ben Rucker, and Abner Shackelford, and uh, Levi Bell, and Dr. Robinson, and their wives, and the widow Bartley. Reverend Hobson and Dr. Robinson was down to the end of the town a-hunting together. That is, I mean the doctor was shipping a sick man to other world, and the preacher was pintin' him right. Or lawyer Bell was away up to Louisville on business, but the rest was on hand, and so they all come and shook hands with the king, and thanked him, and talked to him, and then they shook hands with the duke, 
and didn't say nothing, but just kept a smiling and bobbing their heads like a passel of sap heads, whilst he made all sorts of signs with his hands and said, Go, 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 all the time like a baby that can't talk. So the king he blattered along and managed to inquire about pretty much everybody and dog in town by his name, and mentioned all sorts of little things that happened one time or another in the town, or to George's family, or to Peter and he always let on that Peter wrote him the things, but that was a lie. He got every blessed one of them out of that young flathead that we canoed up to the steamboat. Then Mary Jane, she fetched the letter her father left behind, and the king he read it out loud and cried over it. It give the dwelling-house and three thousand dollars gold to the girls, and it give the tanyard, uh, which was doing a good business, along with some other houses and land, worth about seven thousand, and three thousand dollars in gold to Harvey and William, and told where the six thousand cash was hid down cellar. So these two frauds said they'd go and fetch it up, and have everything square and above board, and told me to come with a candle. We shut the cellar door behind us, and when they found the bag they spilt it out on the floor, and it was a lovely sight, all of them yaller boys. My, the way the king's eyes did shine! He slaps the duke on the shoulder and says, Oh, this ain't bully nor nothin'. Oh, no, I reckon not. Why, Bilgy, it beats the nonsuch, don't it? The duke allowed it did. They pawed the yaller boys, and sifted them through their fingers, and let them jingle down on the floor, and the king says, It ain't no use talkin', being brothers to a rich dead man, and representatives of furrin heirs that's got left, is the line for you and me, Bilge. This here comes of trustin' to Providence. It's the best way in the long run. I've tried em all, and there ain't no better way. Most everybody would have been satisfied with the pile, and took it on trust, but no, they must count it. So they counts it, and it comes out four hundred and fifteen dollars short, says the king. Dern him! I wonder what he done with that four hundred and fifteen dollars. They worried over that a while, and ransacked all around for it. Then the duke says, Well, he was a pretty sick man, and likely he made a mistake. I reckon that's the way of it. The best way is to let it go, and keep still about it. We can spare it. Oh, shucks, yes, we can spare it. I don't care nothing about that. It's the count I'm thinking about. We want to be awful square and open and above board here, you know. We want to lug this hair money upstairs and count it before everybody. Then there ain't nothing suspicious. But when the dead man says there's six thousand dollars, you know, we don't want to— Hold on, says the duke. Let's make up the deficit. And he begun to haul out yaller boys out of his pocket. It's a most amazing good idea, duke. You have got a rattling clever head on you, says the king. Blessed if the old nonsuch ain't a heppin' us out again. And he begun to haul out yaller jackets and stack them up. It most busted them but they made up the six thousand clean and clear. Say, says the duke, I got another idea. Let's go upstairs and count this money, and then take and give it to the girls. Good land, duke, let me hug you. It's the most dazzling idea ever a man struck. You have certainly got the most astonishing head I ever see. Oh, this is the boss dodge. There ain't no mistake about it. Let them fetch along their suspicions now if they want to. This'll lay em out. When we got upstairs, everybody gathered around the table, and the king he counted it and stacked it up three hundred dollars in a pile, twenty elegant little piles. Everybody looked hungry at it and licked their chops. Then they raked it into the bag again, and I see the king begin to swell himself up for another speech. He says, "'Friends all, my poor brother that lays yonder has done generous by them that's left behind in the vale of sorrows.' He has done generous by these year poor little lambs that he loved and sheltered, and that's left fatherless and motherless. Yes, and we that knowed him knows that he would have done more generous by him if he hadn't have been afeard of wounding his dear William and me. Now, wouldn't he? There ain't no question about it in my mind. Well, then, what kind of brothers would it be that'd stand in his way at such a time? And what kind of uncles would it be that rob, yes, rob, such poor sweet lambs as these that he loved so at such a time. If I know William, and I think I do, he—well, I'll just ask him, 
and he turns around and begins to make a lot of signs to the duke with his hands and the duke he looks at him stupid and leather-headed a while then all of a sudden he seems to catch his meaning and jumps for the king goo-gooing with all his might for joy and hugs him about fifteen times before he lets up then the king says i knowed it i reckon that'll convince anybody the way he feels about it here mary jane susan joner take the money take it all it's the gift of him that lays yonder cold but joyful mary jane she went for him susan and the harelip went for the duke and then such another hugging and kissing i never see yet and everybody crowded up with the tears in their eyes and most shook the hands off them frauds saying all the time you dear good souls how lovely how could you well then pretty soon all hands got to talking about the diseased again and how good he was and what a loss he was and all that and before long a big iron-jawed man worked himself in there from outside and stood a-listening and looking and not saying anything and nobody saying anything to him either because the king was talking and they was all busy listening the king was saying in the middle of something he'd started in on they being particular friends of the diseased that's why they're invited here this evening but to-morrow we want all to come everybody for he respected everybody he liked everybody and so it's fitten that his funeral orgies should be public and so he went a moon and on and on liking to hear himself talk and every little while he fetched in his funeral orgies again till the duke he couldn't stand it no more so he writes on a little scrap of paper obsequies you old fool and folds it up and goes to goo-gooing and reaching it over people's heads to him the king he reads it and puts it in his pocket and says poor william afflicted as he is his heart's all is right asks me to invite everybody to come to the funeral wants me to make em all welcome but he needn't a worried it was just what i was at then he weaves along again perfectly calm and goes to dropping in his funeral orgies again every now and then just like he done before and when he done it the third time he says i say orgies not because it's the common term because it ain't obsequies be in the common term but because orgies is the right term obsequies ain't used in england no more now it's gone out we say orgies now in england orgies is better because it means the thing you're after more exact it's a word that's made up out in a greek orgo outside open abroad and the hebrew jesum to plant cover up hence inter so you see funeral orgies is an opener public funeral he was the worst i ever struck well the iron-jawed man he laughed right in his face everybody was shocked everybody says why doctor and abner shackleford says why robinson hain't you heard the news this is harvey wilkes the king he smiled eager and shoved out his flapper and says is it my poor brother's dear good friend and physician i keep your hands off of me says the doctor you talk like an englishman don't you it's the worst imitation i ever heard you peter wilkes brother you're a fraud that's what you are well how they all took on they crowded around the doctor and tried to quiet him down and tried to explain to him and tell him how harvey showed in forty ways that he was harvey and knowed everybody by name and the names of the very dogs and begged and begged him not to hurt harvey's feelings and the poor girl's feelings and all that but it warn't no use he stormed right along and said any man that pretended to be an englishman and couldn't imitate the lingo no better than what he did was a fraud and a liar the poor girls was hanging to the king and crying and all of a sudden the doctor ups and turns on them he says i was your father's friend and i'm your friend and i warn you as a friend and an honest one that wants to protect you and keep you out of harm and trouble to turn your backs on that scoundrel and have nothing to do with him the ignorant tramp with his idiotic greek and hebrew as he calls it he is the thinnest kind of an impostor has come here with a lot of empty names and facts which he picked up somewheres and you take them for proofs and are helped to fool yourselves by these foolish friends here who ought to know better mary jane wilkes 
you know me for your friend, and for your unselfish friend, too. Now listen to me. Turn this pitiful rascal out. I beg you to do it. Will you? Mary Jane straightened herself up, and my, but she was handsome. She says, Here is my answer. She hove up the bag of money and put it in the king's hands, and says, Take this six thousand dollars and invest it for me and my sisters any way you want to, and don't give us no receipt for it. Then she put her arm around the king on one side, and Susan and the hare lip done the same on the other. Everybody clapped their hands and stomped on the floor like a perfect storm, whilst the king held up his head and smiled proud. The doctor says, All right, I wash my hands of the matter, but I warn you all that a time's a coming when you're going to feel sick whenever you think of this day. And away he went. All right, doctor says the king, kinder mocking him, we'll try and get em to send for you, which made them all laugh, and they said it was a prime good hit. Chapter 26 A Pious King, the King's Clergy, She Asked His Pardon, Hiding in the Room, Huck Takes the Money. Well, when they was all gone, the king, he asks Mary Jane, how they was off for spare rooms, and she said she had one spare room, which would do for Uncle William, and she'd give her own room to Uncle Harvey, which was a little bigger, and she would turn into the room with her sisters and sleep on a cot, and up garret was a little cubby with a pallet in it. The king said the cubby would do for his valley, uh, meaning me. So Mary Jane took us up, and she showed them their rooms, which was plain but nice, she said she'd have her frocks and a lot of other traps took out of her room if they was in Uncle Harvey's way, but he said they weren't. The frocks was hung along the wall, and before them was a curtain made out of calico that hung down to the floor. There was an old hair trunk in one corner, and a guitar box in another, and all sorts of little knick-knacks and jim-cracks around, like girls briskin' up a room with. The king said it was all the more homely and more pleasanter for these fixings, and so don't disturb them. The duke's room was pretty small, but plenty good enough, and so was my cubby. That night they had a big supper, and all of them men and women was there, and I stood behind the king and the duke's chairs and waited on them, and the niggers waited on the rest. Mary Jane, she sat at the head of the table, with Susan alongside of her, and said how bad the biscuits was, and how mean the preserves was, and how ornery and tough the fried chicken was, and all that kind of rot, the way women always do for to force out compliments. And the people all knowed everything was tip-top, and said so, said, How do you get biscuits to brown so nice? And where, for land's sake, did you get these mazin' pickles? And all that kind of humbug talky-talk just the way people always does at supper, you know. When it was all done, me and the hare lip had supper in the kitchen, off of the leavens, whilst the others was helping the niggers clean up the things. The hare lip, she got to pumping me about England, and blessed if I didn't think the ice was getting mighty thin sometimes. She says, Did you ever see the king? Who, uh, William Fourth? Well, I bet I have. I, he goes to our church. I knowed he was dead years ago, but I never let on. So when I says he goes to our church, she says, What, regular? Yes, regular. His pew's right over opposite Arn, uh, on t'other side of the pulpit. I thought he lived in London. Well, he does. Where would he live? But I thought you lived in Sheffield. I see I was up a stump. I had to let on to get choked with a chicken bone so as to get time to think how to get down again. Then I says, well, I mean, he goes to our church regular when he's in Sheffield. That's only in the summer time, when he comes there to take the sea baths. Why, how you talk? Sheffield ain't on the sea. Well, who said it was? Why, you did. I didn't, nother. You did. I didn't. You did. I never said nothing of the kind. Well, what did you say, then? Said he come to take the sea baths, that's what I said. Well, then, how's he going to take the sea baths if it ain't on the sea? Look here, I says. Did you ever see any Congress water? Yes. Well, do you have to go to Congress to get it? 
"'Why, no.' "'Well, neither does William Forth have to go to the sea to get sea bath. How does he get it, then?' gets it the way people down here gets congress water in barrels there in the palace at sheffield they've got furnaces and he wants his water hot they can't buy that amount of water way off there at the sea they haven't got no conveniences for it oh i see now you might have said that in the first place and saved time when she said that i see i was out of the woods again and so i was comfortable and glad next she says do you go to church too yes regular where do you set why in our pew whose pew why ourn your uncle harvey's his'n what does he want with a pew wants it to set in what did you reckon he wanted with it why i thought he'd be in the pulpit rot him i forgot he was a preacher i see i was up a stump again so i played another chicken bone and got another think and then i says blame it uh, do you suppose there ain't but one preacher to a church why what do they want with more what to preach before a king i never did see such a girl as you they don't have no less than seventeen seventeen my land why i wouldn't set out such a string as that not if i never got to glory it must take em a week shucks they don't all of them preach the same day only one of em well then what does the rest of them do oh nothing much loll around pass the plate and one thing or another but mainly they don't do nothing well then what are they for why they're for style don't you know nothing well i don't want to know no such foolishness as that how is servants treated in england do they treat em better than we treat our niggers no a servant ain't nobody there they treat them worse than dogs. Don't they give em holidays the way we do? Christmas and New Year's week and Fourth of July? Oh, just listen. A body could tell you hain't ever been to England by that. Why, Harold, uh, why, Joanna, they never see a holiday from year's end to year's end. Never go to the circus, nor a theater, nor nigger shows, nor nowheres. Nor church? Nor church. But you always went to church. Well, I was gone up again. I forgot I was the old man's servant, but next minute I whirled in on a kind of an explanation how a valley was different from a common servant, and had to go to church whether he wanted to or not, and set with the family on account of its being the law. But I didn't do it pretty good, and when I got home I see she weren't satisfied. She says, "'Honest Injun, now ain't you been telling me a lot of lies?' "'Honest Injun,' says I. "'None of it at all?' none of it at all not a lie in it says i lay your hand on this book and say it i see it weren't nothing but a dictionary so i laid my hand on it and said it so then she looked a little better satisfied and says well then i'll believe some of it but i hope to gracious if i'll believe the rest what is it you won't believe joe says mary jane stepping in with susan behind her it ain't right nor kind for you to talk so to him and him a stranger and so far from his people how would you like to be treated so that's always your way mame always sailing in to help somebody before they're hurt i hain't done nothing to him he's told some stretchers i reckon and i said i wouldn't swallow it all and that's every bit and grain i did say i reckon he can stand a little thing like that can't he i don't care whether twas a little or whether twas big he's here in our house and a stranger and it wasn't good of you to say it if you was in his place it would make you feel ashamed and so you ought to say a thing to another person that will make them feel ashamed why mame he said i don't make no difference what he said that ain't the thing the thing is for you to treat him kind and not be saying things to make him remember he ain't in his own country and amongst his own folks i says to myself this is a girl that i am letting that old reptile rob her of her money then susan she waltzed in and if you'll believe me she did give harelip hark from the tomb says i to myself and this is another one that i'm letting him rob her of her money then mary jane she took another inning and went in sweet and lovely again which was her way and when she got done there weren't hardly anything left of poor harelip so she hollered all right then says the other girls you just ask his pardon she done it too 
she done it beautiful. She done it so beautiful it was good to hear. And I wished I could tell her a thousand lies so she could do it again. I says to myself, this is another one that I'm letting him rob her of her money. And when she got through, they all just laid theirselves out to make me feel at home and know I was amongst friends. I felt so ornery and low down and mean that I says to myself, my mind's made up, I'll hive that money for them or bust. So then I lit out, for bed, I said, meaning some time or another. When I got by myself, I went to thinking the thing over. I says to myself, shall I go to that doctor private and blow on these frauds? No, that won't do. He might tell who told him. Then the king and the duke would make it warm for me. Shall I go private and tell Mary Jane? No, I danced to it. Her face would give them a hint, sure. They've got the money, and they'd slide right out and get away with it. If she was to fetch in help, I'd get mixed up in the business before it was done with, I judge. No, there ain't no good way but one. I got to steal that money somehow, and I got to steal it some way they won't suspicion that I done it. They've got a good thing here, and they ain't a-going to leave till they've played this family and this town for all they're worth, so I'll find a chance time enough. I'll steal it and hide it, and by and by, when I'm away down the river, I'll write a letter and tell Mary Jane where it's hid. But I'd better hive it tonight if I can, because the doctor maybe hasn't let up as much as he lets on he has. He might scare them out of here yet. So, thinks I, I'll go and search them rooms. Upstairs the hall was dark, but I found the Duke's room, and started to paw round it with my hands. But I recollected it wouldn't be much like the King to let anybody else take care of that money but his own self. So then I went to his room and begun to paw round there. But I see I couldn't do nothing without a candle, and it doesn't light one, of course. So I judged I'd go to do the other thing, lay for them and eavesdrop. About that time I hears their footsteps coming. I was going to skip under the bed. I reached for it, but it wasn't where I thought it would be. But I touched the curtain that hid Mary Jane's frocks. So I jumped in behind that and snuggled in amongst the gowns and stood there perfectly still. They come in and shut the door, and the first thing the Duke done was to get down and look under the bed. Then I was glad I hadn't found the bed when I wanted it. And yet, you know, it's kind of natural to hide under the bed when you're up to anything private. They sets down then, and the King says, Well, what is it? And cut it middlin' short, because it's better for us to be down there a whoopin' up the morning than up here giving em a chance to talk us over. Well, this is it, Cabot. It ain't easy. It ain't comfortable. That doctor lays on my mind. I wanted to know your plans. I've got a notion, and I think it's a sound one. What is it, Duke? That we better glide out of this before three in the morning and clip it down the river with what we've got, specially seeing we got it so easy, given back to us, flung at our heads, as you may say, when of course we allowed to have to steal it back. I'm for knocking off and lighting out. That made me feel pretty bad. About an hour or two ago it, it would have been a little different, but now it made me feel bad and disappointed. The king rips out and says, What? And not sell out the rest of the property? March off like a passel of fools and leave eight or nine thousand dollars worth of property laying round just suffering to be scooped in? And all good saleable stuff, too. The duke, he crumbled, said the bag of gold was enough, and he didn't want to go no deeper didn't want to rob a lot of orphans of everything they had. "'Why, how you talk,' says the king. "'We shan't rob em of nothing at all but just this money. The people that buys the property is the sufferers, because as soon as it's found out that we didn't own it, which won't be long after we've slid, the sale won't be valid, and it'll all go back to the estate. These yer orphans will get their house back again, and that's enough for them.' They're young and spry and can easy earn a living. They ain't a-going to suffer. Why, just think, there's thousands and thousands that ain't nice so well off. Bless you, they ain't got nothing to complain of. Well, the king, he talked him blind, so at last he give in and said all right, but said he believed it was blame foolishness to stay and that doctor hanging over them. But the king says, Cuss the doctor. What do we care for him? Ain't we got all the fools in town on our side? And ain't that a big enough majority in any town? 
So they got ready to go downstairs again. Duke says, I don't think we put that money in a good place. That cheered me up. I began to think I weren't going to get a hint of no kind to help me. The king says, Why? Because Mary Jane will be in mourning from this out, and first you know the nigger that does up the rooms will get an order to box these duds up and put em away, and you reckon a nigger can run across money and not borrow some of it? Your head's level again, Duke, says the king, and he comes a-fumbling under the curtain two or three foot from where I was. I stuck tight to the wall and kept mighty still, though quivery, and I wondered what them fellows would say to me if they catched me and I tried to think what I'd better do if they did catch me. But the king he got the bag before I could think more than about half a thought, and he never suspicioned I was around. They took and shoved the bag through a rip in the straw tick that was under the feather bed, and crammed it in a foot or two amongst the straw, and said it was all right now, because a nigger only makes up the feather bed, and don't turn over the straw tick only about twice a year, and so it weren't in no danger of getting stole now. But I knowed better. I had it out of there before they was halfway downstairs. I groped along up to my cubby and hid it there till I could get a chance to do better. I judged I'd better hide it outside of the house somewheres, because if they missed it they would give the house a good ransacking. I know that very well. Then I turned in, with my clothes all on, but I couldn't have gone to sleep if I'd have wanted to. I was in such a sweat to get through with the business. By and by I heard the king and the duke come up. So I rolled off my pallet and laid with my chin at the top of my ladder, and waited to see if anything was going to happen. But nothing did. So I held on till all the late sounds had quit, and the early ones hadn't begun yet. And then I slipped down the ladder. 